Welcome everybody to episode 2195 of the Tom Wood Show. We are fortunate to have with us our old friend Carla Garrick from the Free State Project. She is joining us from New Hampshire, and we're going to talk about all kinds of fun and exciting things going on there. So Carla, welcome back. Always delighted to be here. Thanks so much for having me, and it has indeed been exciting times here. Okay, well, let's get right into it. Uh, give me news item number one we can chew on. So, secession, you know, which is uh, the new hot topic here. We just had a hearing on Wednesday. Basically, this lady, a literal Karen, like an actual Karen, being a Karen, filed a complaint with the Ballot Law Commission, where she basically said that all the representatives who filed the bill and voted for the bill, CACR 32, which I'll explain in a second, should be taken off the ballot because they are not qualified to run as candidates. So this lady was very, very upset that there was a bill that was introduced this year that basically said, I mean, it's a constitutional amendment. We don't have referendums here in New Hampshire. And all the bill said is that it provided that the state would peacefully, peaceably declares independence from the United States and proceeds as a sovereign nation. Now, because it's a constitutional amendment, it actually has to get 60% in the legislature. And then if it goes on the ballot, 67% of Granite Staters actually have to vote for it. So there's like nothing weird about it. It's just a bill, it was introduced, they got their you know butts handed to them, only 13 people voted for it. But the idea was that we would start this conversation and sort of see what the appetite of Granite Staters is. So yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Um, I was, so what were the so reasons that these people were not qualified because they, they have an opinion that's unfashionable that she doesn't like? I mean, basically, you know, she 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 claimed that they were violating the 14th Amendment, Section 3, that uh, basically that they we were uh, they were aiding and abetting the uh, enemies of the state and that it is an insurrection what? or uh, uh, what's the other word that they like to throw around there? Insurrection or rebellion? Peaceful right? withdrawal is insurrection and rebellion? Yeah, it's it's very confusing. So, I mean, one has to assume because this came up, you know, I don't know, two weeks before the primary, that it's a ploy, right? That someone was like, oh, maybe we could try this and maybe we could disqualify these candidates because frankly, Tom, We've had a lot of really cool, interesting things going on. Uh, there's enough sway here in the free state and, and enough appetite and enough activists that uh, you know we're starting to ruffle a lot of feathers in a lot of places at the same time because we're actually being effective. And so based on just the media um, interest, I mean, this week alone, I had the Boston Globe at my house for like half a day, uh, NBC Boston, was out, they followed me for the entire day on Wednesday. Uh, they came with me to this hearing, they sat with me at the house while I did some podcasts and some shows. So there's definitely this interest. When I ask them, hey, you know, and I'm very candid with, with the reporters now, I'm just like, look, I'm just gonna tell it like it is, at least what I think I'm seeing. So the NBC guys came out to Porkfest and they followed us around, they talked to a lot of people, and they were following up on that. And, and so I said, hey, you know, like, what's your angle for the hit piece? Because I could probably help yeah, you yeah. connect you with the right people, right? You know, are you secession, school choice, guns, homeschooling? Like, what's your, what's your beef with us this week? And they laughed. And, and actually, the, the lady reporter said, you know, Carla, you guys are so, cause they actually ended up having a pretty good time at Porkfest. So she goes, well, you know, you guys are so interesting and we're not really sure like what angle to take. So we've discussed it with the producer and we're just gonna present it as it is. And I went, oh, you mean like old fashioned reporting? Imagine that. <laughs> well, I'm still in the I'll believe it when I see it camp. Oh, of course, no, I'm gonna assume it's gonna be 
you know, it's it's going to be what it's going to be. But partly what I've tried to do over the years is, as you know, I'm just I'm just genuinely trying to live my authentic self and put forward the ideas that I think are valid. And certainly with something like this, this secession thing, you know, I actually testified on the bill when when it went up. And, you know, I don't think anyone can fault anyone who's pursuing this idea if we're trying to do it peacefully we're trying to do it through the legislative process. And if we're trying to include as many granite staters as possible, and that's the way I wanna do it. One of the cool things that came out of the ballot, uh, ballot law commission. So they, you know, they heard her, she had a stack of paper this thick and, you know, she was going droning on and on and, oh, there was these experts at Berkeley, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I could probably find some experts down south that might have a differing opinion here. <laughs> yeah, all over the country you could find in the middle, the Middlebury Institute in Vermont. I, I don't know if there's still a, a going concern or not, but I don't think Kirkpatrick Sale is deceased. I think he's still going and he's always, and, and is, I'll argue this stuff, incidentally, it so happens that just days before this particular conversation, I actually released yet another of my notorious free ebooks. I actually bought the domain nationaldivorce.com. Oh, that's smart. So I've just released uh, an ebook for free uh, at that website called National Divorce The Peaceful Solution to Irreconcilable Differences. And so, oh, it, whether or not New Hampshire succeeds in it, it's very important for the world to see a small unit declaring that it has the right to withdraw from a larger unit because we've gotten so lazy philosophically. Mm. We've got we've had such a status quo bias in our minds that we think these super gigantic states like the United States are just somehow ends in themselves. But they, they were never thought to be an end ends in themselves. Like Thomas Jefferson's view was maybe the union will work and promote liberty and maybe it won't. We don't treat it as an object of religious reverence but before which we're supposed to bend the knee and make sacrifices. But that's the way almost everybody thinks about it today. Yeah, and it's interesting. One of the things I like to bring up is that, you know, decentralization is actually a trend, right? If you look back in the 19th century, I think there were like 79, 80 countries. And then now there are over 230 countries. Yeah, and so how'd that know. happen? Did, 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 did extra countries drop from the sky? How'd that happen? <laughs> Right. I mean, exactly. And and so and and of course, with the Free State Project, what we're trying to do is to bring the libertarians here so that people who share our values can have a homeland or can have a place where, you know, we can do the things that are important to us. And, you know, if you don't like that, maybe you could go somewhere else or I don't know why someone wouldn't like liberty. You know, this is the question that fascinates me. People are, you know, we're getting attacked from a lot of fronts. So, so that makes me feel like we are becoming an actual legitimate threat. One of the things I heard was the NHLA, which of course is a, um, uh, a 501c3. I think they have a PAC arm too, but they're a different organization that sort of vets candidates. And I think they've uh, endorsed over 150 people running this time. So, you know, there's a legitimate groundswell. And of course, COVID woke up a lot of, you know, the, the, the maybe more disengaged libertarians in the state, you know, the, the, the Ron Paulians, right? The apathy, you know, Ron Paul cured my apathy people. So people are starting to go, oh, wait a second, we should be paying attention and we should see what's going on. So this, this real life Karen, so she testifies the, the state reps actually didn't even, only one of them showed up. The others were just like, this is a farce. Here's what I think. They sent in some emails and they were just like, no, no, we're not even going to show up. And so she said her bit. And then the commission, quite rightly, was just like, yeah, we don't think we have the jurisdiction to, you know, be deciding what is constitutional, not constitutional. And we also don't think rightly that, you know, we should start to decide who can be on the ballot or not. The, the point of elections is for people to decide, right? So if people don't like these, these folks who voted for this, they, you know, can vote the bums out. And, um, and, the, and that was unanimous. They were like, no. But while they were sort of deliberating, one of the, th the questions that came up, and they had, you know, 
one, uh, two bureaucrats from the Secretary of State's office, and they had a guy from the AG's office. And I think this was really valuable, is the, the AG's office, it was a more junior guy, I hadn't seen him before, his name's Kevin Skurba, Skurra. Anyway, but he did weigh in and he said, look, based on my research, you know, the words insurrection and rebellion actually relate to the use of violence. So, which obviously is the case, right? Like you can't just say, hey, you introduced a bill that has the words peaceably in it that is following the procedure and due process of the state's actual rules and then come along, Karen, and be like, mm, no, you guys shouldn't do it that way and you're not allowed to run for office anymore. So, so the AG was like, nope, these are words, uh, actual insurrection, actual rebellion, does have to involve the use of violence. And I think that's important because yeah. honestly, I feel like they took some of the legislators into a back room uh, soon after this bill was heard because you know I have a pretty good working relationship with everyone, but I can feel there's a new vibe there. I almost felt like, you know that George Carlin joke where he says, when someone becomes president, they take him uh, to, into a room and then they show him the assassination of JFK filmed from the grassy knoll. Like I almost feel <laughs> like, like, like they took him into a room and they showed him a film of the grassy knoll. Like they were kind of like, hey, these people, we think they're trouble and you got to start, you know, keeping your distance. Now I may be entirely wrong. I, I certainly hope I am. But they were talking while we were testifying on it that it was treason, you know, and those kinds of words. And I was just like, man, can no one think anymore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't mean to sound self-promotional, but I, but what irritates me about all this is that instead of actually engaging on the merits of the argument, we just get these demonizing words like treason. It, it, that is, it is not treason because the states can... It was no more treason for the states to join the union than it is for them to withdraw. They joined it because they had the sovereign ability to join it. So they likewise have the sovereign ability to withdraw from it. They can't give away their sovereignty. That's not how sovereignty works. So I do explain this in this ebook at nationaldivorce.com. I, I, you cannot possibly read that and walk away thinking this is treason. You'll walk away thinking, I can't believe nobody taught me this in school. And then you'll start thinking, why didn't they teach me this in school? Why was I taught this BS? So, <laughs> right. so that's the way it goes. Well, anyway, again, I think it's a useful topic to bring up whether or not the public is ready for it. Because the, the thing is, you can't, the public never gets ready if it never hears it. If you right. don't start talking about an unthinkable idea, it never becomes thinkable. Whereas the other side, the pro-government side, never has this problem. They're willing to start talking about unthinkable things until they become thinkable. Well, it's about time we learn from them because they've been doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at the crazy abortion laws, these late term, uh, you know, in Vermont and California, where I honestly, I was like, that can't be true. And then I went into my own research and I was like, oh, no, in California, they're like, oh, you could abort a child up until the second, like the head is crowning. And I was like, well, if those are the anchors, then I'm going to move the Overton window as far as I can. But we actually, from the Foundation for New Hampshire Independence, we, we commissioned a survey, like a real paid official survey recently, because, you know, I thought, okay, it should be valuable to have some baselines. Because back when Brexit happened in 2016, we did some informal polls and the number that was coming up was actually around 40%. Now, this is just like online newspaper polls and, yeah. you, know, it yeah. was, you know, we were definitely ginning it a little. But, um, but this official poll that we didn't have a hand in that was paid, you know, it, it was beyond our control. Um, so 29% of New Hampshireites in this survey overall supported secession. And get this, Tom, 52% of Republicans would secede today. <laughs> so, so while the governor may be angry at me, I can tell him the majority of Republicans now support my position. <laughs> right, right, right. So then the governor can compromise. All you have to do is just take the mild, moderate, mainstream compromise position of nullification. 
you know right that that now becomes you've moved the overton window so much that nullification becomes more acceptable and honestly you know i'm running again not for senate but i'm going to run for the house so i'm just running literally in ward 11 which is entirely doable so i'm feeling pretty confident about it like i actually have a winnable race in the past it's been a slog. I mean, I've been slogging and it went from 38 to 46 percent, you know, just slogging yeah. against this lion. So I think this time it's it's going to happen. Are you, you know, allowed? So talking, are you allowed? Because I know you're going to use this on your uh, program. And I don't know if they allow you to, to give out the website of a, a political website. But do you, I assume you have a website for your race if people want to help I, I you. I do. And actually, I'm just using Carla for everything now okay. so i have donation page up there and i'm just going to hold up my book so people can see the spelling of my last name because it doesn't sound the way <laughs> it doesn't spell the right. way no you i'll sound spell it. it for the people listening because awesome. we, we have an unusual video version of this picture so <laughs> so it's g-e-r-i-c-k-e uh g-e-r-i-c-k-e -E, which by the way means it was not originally pronounced garrick but you guys just gave up on anybody trying to figure it out so they so you changed it I did, you know, and I sort of just went with uh, whatever the INS guy at the airport said the first time. I oh, came that's here, funny. You know, yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. And it's, you know, so it's, it's strange. And it actually had held me back for a lot of years, because it's hard to be like, oh, my God, you have to go around saying your name in a way that doesn't feel natural. So it took a really long time to be like, oh, OK, like I don't want every time have to correct people I'm just picking this way. And yeah, this is but, it, you know, you know, somehow Pete Buttigieg got himself into the Department of Transportation with a name like that. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Well, you know, these guys have big, big machines behind them. I mean, I think that's also the thing. Yeah, we're seeing now. yeah. It's you know, it's. It's an interesting time, I will tell you, you know, just making the arguments against the federal government is not that hard. You know, I, I see journalists and really people that I know are staunch lefties nodding along a lot of the time, you know. And as you say, with, with this notion of national divorce, I think we have the right messaging because we are starting to say, and my testimony was certainly like this, is, um, you know, we wouldn't expect because they love this victimhood language, right? So you can start to say that to them, but do you expect me to stay with an abuser? And are you actually arguing that I don't have a right to leave an abusive relationship, which is what they're arguing, of course. Yeah, yeah. And so I think they're going to find themselves very boxed in now. And, and in that survey, I, th I, I think the last interesting data point to me was only 3% of respondents supported any use of violence for someone who does want to go their own mm. way. And yeah. I thought that's pretty positive, right? Yes, yes, now, yes. Of course, yeah, because you know, you don't want that to be the issue. Like we're really trying to do something peacefully, but with nullification, I think that's the trick. I think that's the space to play in. And you know, we just passed a bill here in New Hampshire, I forget, I think it was like 1178 or something, but it's a gun law bill that passed and the governor signed it. And it basically says that any federal, local law enforcement may not support any federal action in the state of New Hampshire that relates to gun laws. So if there is any kind of federal gun confiscation laws that they pass or red flag, national red flag or any of that, it's basically unenforceable here. So I'm interested in, as we get more pro-liberty free staters and just pro-liberty folks in, how can we expand this notion of nullification, right? Can we start to do it with banking? Um, I want to build out a second nuclear reactor. So can we just go, you know what? Any of your nuclear regs do not apply here, you know? So I do think we don't have to push it all the way to actual secession. But we should be having that conversation because who knows, 10 more years, which is pretty much my timeline, things may be really bad. I don't know. I keep looking at that death clock and it's not right, getting right, better. Right, <laughs> right, right. And it's not like some hand came down from heaven and drew the boundaries of the United States and said, it shall be this exact shape. I mean, first of all, it wasn't that exact shape through all of American history because Americans expanded. So why is it okay? So the shape can expand, but it can never contract. Which heavenly command was that? 
Right. You know, so the, the whole the, the status quo bias is so strong that it's the, U, the U.S. can expand but never contract. Why? Well, and, and who says large states are better than small ones? A lot of times the small ones are where uh, liberty uh, flourishes better. Uh, uh, F.A. Hayek said that in the future it was more likely that liberty would flourish in smaller states. And when you look at some of the most livable places around the world, they're not always places with hundreds of millions of people in them. You know, I, I would love to live in Malta. I'd have no problem living there. I have no idea how many people live in Malta, but I'm pretty sure you can walk from one side of it to the other in 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's and, and I think that's a very good point. And again, it goes back to that notion of decentralization. Of course, you and I think it should be decentralized down to the individual, right? And but I'll take what should... I can get in the meantime. Well, me too, me too. <laughs> Um, but, you know, if New Hampshire was an independent country, because we have this nuclear reactor uh, that still runs um, and we have a second license, it could be very interesting because we are actually supplying, you know, a, a fair amount of the uh, energy of the eastern seaboard. So if we get the second one built, that would actually give us a base, you know, that would be like, you know, I don't if a country can just run on tourism, I'll certainly give it a shot. But I think if we had tourism and you know energy to export, that that could be really interesting. But also, you know, trying to build these sort of safe havens for wealth, you know, for people who want to have maybe their their main domicile in a certain place that is uh, favorable, you know, to crypto, say, or something. So really, I think you know the sky is the limit, and to that notion where people are just so stuck in the status quo. You know, when I talk to folks and I say things like, well, if, you know, they'll be like, how will this work? How will that work? And I go, it's, uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And they, it seems like they've never even heard that. You know, they're just like, what? You can be creative. Like we can't just follow these, you know, the allowable lines of the index cards, right? Like they're just so blown away by having to think outside the box or to hear these new ideas or to just, you know, consider a different way of life. It's not that scary. No, no, it's not. There's, and all it, it just means that instead of us constantly at war with each other, trying to force our worldviews on each other, maybe we say, how about a bunch of you try out your thing over here and we'll try out our thing over, over here and then we can trade with each other and travel back and forth and see how everybody's doing. But maybe that's a more humane way than to say everybody must be subordinate to my plan for organizing society. Maybe that's not, you know, maybe we, maybe we should try something a little different. This is this instead of just doing the same thing over and over. Right. Aren't you supposed to be a liberated thinker? Right. You know, you're supposed right. to be a progressive, you know, who will consider new ideas. Here's a new idea. How about not doing the same darn thing over and over again? Well, not only that, you know, I, I I find it fascinating to see what I get censored on Twitter for or what, do, you know, is just clearly shadow banned because, you know, I have at least two fans that will like everything I do. So when not even those guys are in there, I'm like, no one saw this tweet, right? And one of them recently was literally, I posted antonyms to the word radical. Because I was like, okay, if you're going to keep calling me a radical, let's just talk about what that means. And I was like, well, the opposite of a radical is someone who's outdated, conventional, stayed, um, basically boring and stuck in their ways, right? And I'm like, so which one would you actually rather be? I'm like, so maybe being radical, in air quotes, of course, isn't the worst of things. Um, but, you know, I think it's this, 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 it's the move towards socialism is what it is, right? Socialism in its finest form is just saying there's only one solution and it's mine, right? It's the state solution, this one way. And so they hate the notion of federalism or having different competing things because of course, if we're competing, they're going to see that their ideas suck. Well, indeed. Well, let's see, how, how long does your show typically run by the way, Carla? Uh, it, it's about 30 minutes. So, okay. So we have a handful of minutes left. Okay. Do you want to switch to something else or do you want to expand on this? No, I think what, you know, I, I was going to mention, you know, just basically we're, we are seeing a lot of attacks on free staters and I just want to remind yeah. folks, especially your audience and people like that. Um, 
life in New Hampshire is fantastic. It's a good living, you know, and, and if people are seeing a lot of like, you know, sort of negative stuff. In fact, there was a front page article today in the newspaper, uh, the union leader and uh, the headline under religion, concerns raised after website IDs woke churches. Website promoted by Free State Project listed many churches that display a LBGTQ plus flag. And so this was a list that just some uh, random Free Stater generated on his own website. And someone from our social media team shared it on under the FSP account saying, here's an index of all the churches in New Hampshire, Christian churches. They're doing Jewish now and I guess the rest will come, right? So um, it's like a wiki page and it's got things. So one of the categories that this gentleman did on his own was, is this church woke or based? I don't even know that there's a common definition of the word woke. And I personally probably wouldn't just say, oh, just a gay pride flag makes you woke, but whatever, it was his list, right? People have gone bananas. I, I saw a Google alert for this story from Newsweek Business, no, Business Week in India covered this story. <laughs> And you've got to be like, what is that about? Um, so, you know, all of it's nonsense. And we have asked for a bit of a correction because they did really way over swing. But this, this one lady's quote is, is literally, so the New Hampshire Council of Churches explicitly condemns the use of woke in this case as a racist dog whistle designed to incite white supremacist behavior and activity. Oh. And I'm just like, are these people bananas? I think what they're trying to do is they're trying, I, I do think the play is they're trying to SEO, you know, with search engine words and stuff, actually yeah, tie, right. you know, FSP to, uh, to, to uh, what is a dog whistle? Can someone explain this to me? So yeah, the whole, it's, a, it's a dumb, saying, yeah, the whole thing's we, dumb. We, uh, New we're Hampshire. imagining that what you're thinking. New Hampshire is one of the whitest states in America. I highly doubt there's major white supremacist organizing going on. <laughs> it makes no you know, sense. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's very bizarre. I mean, I will say that it was weird is a bunch of like proud boys have started showing up at things. None of us know them. So it's definitely not our people, but they're all wearing yellow and black colors, which is weird because that's the libertarian colors. And then um, they, they started sort of showing up if we were having a, 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 a protest or something. I think there was a pro-independence thing and they kind of showed up and we're like, we don't want to uh, be with you guys. We'll go across the street. And they would kind of follow us around. And I was like, man, are you guys all, did you hang up your, you know, cocky dockers and your blue shirt for this particular one and just kind of take out the yellow and black? Because it seems suspicious, right? I've been in the state for 14 years. I've been doing libertarian stuff for a long time. And I'm like, this whole bubbling up thing, it's like, it's not what it's about. It's certainly not what's happening in New Hampshire. And if someone had told me, you know, 25 years, 30 years ago, when I was an anti-apartheid activist, that I would literally have to talk to the media all the time about denying that I'm a white supremacist, I would have told you you're frigging nuts in America, never. And yet here we are. Yeah. Well, of course, the, the term is inapplicable to almost everybody. I don't know anybody who favors assigning a superior position to the white race through the law. I don't know anyone who favors that. So this is in their crazed imagination. Uh, not to mention, if you if you come across the you know, if you go to Port Fest and you visit with a lot of our people. What you find is, uh, number one, these are some of the nicest people in the world. Number two, they're very smart, and you can't judge them on the basis of their appearance. You, you'll see people in ratty T-shirts and sandals, and you think you can judge and, and know everything about them. They know the history of this, and the, the, they, they know the ins and outs of that like you wouldn't believe. They're some of the most informed people around, and what they want is all they want is peace for i mean that really i think the libertarian message can really be boiled down to peace we we yep. say non-aggression but what's another word for non-aggression it's just peace yes. not only between nations but between individuals that's all we want is peace 
So of course we have to be demonized and ridiculed by people who want anything but peace. They want strife and mutual mistrust and misunderstanding, and they want to they want to fan the flames of of, mm. of hatred. That that's what they're projecting that onto us. Yeah, no, and we see it all the time. You know that uh, you know people. I mean, my friends don't laugh, but you know, I get death threats. I've had my car's wheels spiked, you know, like, and, and I always go, who are these people? Like, have you met me? I, you know, I come in peace clearly. Um, our, our entire philosophy of libertarianism is based on the ethical stance of non-aggression. And every time I talk to a journalist, I tell them that, and you can tell they don't want to grapple with it because they want this to be the story. They want this other thing that they're propagandizing about. And it's clear to me now having, you know, I've been a student of propaganda for a long time. I should actually be better at it by now. But, you know, you can clearly see that they're trying to 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 drive this wedge and to 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 color us in a way that is is not truthful. You know, and you've been to Porkfest. I, I've been doing it a long time. The journalists who come actually walk away with this whole thing where they're like, yeah, you guys are kind of like hippies with guns, you know, like <laughs> they're just very confused because they're like, oh, you're all smart people. You know, it's not like you're just dummies who are like, oh, you're, you know, yahoos in the woods, you know, it's and and so long term, I know we're going to win, right? Because it, it, it's definitely trending that way. But we are also now it's it's in the fight. And, and part of it is the messaging. I'm so excited for this website, National Divorce, that's trending all the time on, on, uh, on Twitter. I see, you know, probably once a week. I started tracking that, and that's the discussion that has to happen. And honestly, if the, if the end game is, and if the takeaway eventually is for the Free State Project, that we reinvigorated federalism in a true way where the states are again competing and we we you know disband the department of education and disband the fbi and all these organizations and we stop making the wars um and we just then again let the states do what they were supposed to be doing then we don't have to go to these extremes but until they're willing to actually get that yoke of the federal government off us i say all of this is on the table well, Carla, I want to give people one more time your website. So it's just carlagarrick.com. It's G-E-R-I-C-K-E.com. And I'm linking to it on my show notes page, which is tomwoods.com slash 2195 for episode 2195. And all I can say is continued success in getting the word out there. And it's always a pleasure having these conversations. Thank you. I, I love doing your show. Thank you so much for having me on. And I'll talk to you again in about a quarter. Excellent. Hopefully I will be a sitting rep then. <laughs> yes. Hooray. Let's hope for that.